So, um, okay. So uh, we're gonna start now with the session about data sharing. Um, if you guys are on the data sharing panel, you can come up here with your name tense and put your stuff up here on the panel. And then my colleague, Rob Rowley, is the fortunate person who responded to the email where I asked him if he would moderate a session. So Rob is gonna moderate this session. You know, I just sat through that last session seeing all the new opportunities for making diagnoses. And we're having such a, a challenge with getting sequencing information standardized. So we're going to take on a whole new session, which was titled Data Sharing is Caring. But I'd like to do a palindrome here and say caring for patients is data sharing. And it helps us actually identify, um, how do we identify information or share information to be able to make diagnosis, come up with new treatments, and then understand the disease itself. So uh, I will hand it over to Heidi to give our first presentation. Understand it here? Yes, uh, sure. Great. Excellent. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, all right, operate system. Excellent. Um, okay. I so I as mentioned, I was asked to talk a little bit about data sharing as sort of a backdrop to this um, discussion. So I um, I wanted to start with one of my favorite graphs from the Orphanet database that talks about um, the prevalence of rare diseases, and the point they're making here is that the vast majority of individuals walking around on the planet with rare disease. And we all talk about, oh, rare disease is actually really common in an aggregate. One in 10 individuals has rare disease. But the truth is all most of the people with rare disease, whoops, um, actually have it due to a very small number of common rare diseases. And in fact, most of the stuff um, that we're all trying to solve is in this bar, the thousands of rare diseases that are present in fewer than one in a million. And that means that there's really no way to do the rest of this without sharing data because the average researcher or clinician or clinical lab is only going to see one of these patients ever in their lifetime. So we have to absolutely share data if we're going to solve the rest of rare disease. Um, now, why do we share? There's lots of reasons. We want to discover new gene disease relationships. We want to classify the validity of those GDRs. We want to classify the pathogenicity of variants. We want to define the natural history of disease or understand the mechanism so we can inform clinical trials and treatments, um, all sorts of reasons. I don't think I should need to convince any of you that this is useful. Um, and it's not just researchers, it's clinical labs. It's also patients engaging in the sharing process. And then I made the things to share side and I kind of group it into two areas, knowledge, um, knowledge of gene candidates or knowledge about the classification of variants versus the actual data or evidence that underlies our knowledge, like the genomic data, phenotype, genetic observations, like de novo occurrence, segregation data, that mysterious linkage stuff, uh, cis-trans, as well as all the other data types we talked about in the first session and making sure we capture that. And of course, um, functional assays to inform a lot of the variation that we see. So um, there's lots of different platforms and ways to share this type of data. Many of you who work in the rare disease space are probably familiar with the Matchmaker Exchange. Um, we built this platform as a community now 10 years ago. It's been, in my mind, one of the most critical platforms for share, solving rare diseases in this era of rare, rare diseases. Um, and there's been you know, thousands of, of discoveries made, a lot of them using the gene matcher platform that anyone can register and use. Um, and that's been great. One you know, challenge is that a lot of data is being generated in clinical labs. And I actually put the stats on the percentage of data in ClinVar and its sources here. And what you see is 96% of that data comes from clinical labs. And so it points to the fact that 
a huge amount of the interpreted rare disease data is actually in clinical labs, not in research realms. And so we really have to think about engaging the clinical laboratory community pretty strongly here. And actually through the Gregor Consortium, we just um, submitted a paper to GIM. It's accepted pending revisions. But the goal was to really point to the clinical labs and say, hey, don't ignore novel gene discovery. Be a part of it. Submit your genes to Matchmaker Exchange. Submit your variants, uh, even in novel genes, to ClinVar. Put them on clinical reports so the patient can actually benefit from knowledge updates over time and even engage in the building evidence part of it. So I really think this is an important area to think about in rare disease research is also how we engage clinical labs. And just this week, we're launching a new clinical genomics laboratory community through a partnership with Global Alliance and ClinGen to really engage this community in many different ways, but one of them is really around the data sharing piece. Um, the other thing, in addition to Matchmaker Exchange, you know, when we launched that platform years ago, I, I used to call it, I still kind of do, uh, data sharing for the paranoid. And the, the idea was like, nobody wanted to release their candidate genes. They wanted to be the one to write the paper on that gene and didn't want to put it out there and didn't want to get scooped. And so it was like a safe way to share your data. Nobody saw it. Only the person who also had that candidate gets to saw, see it. And you see it at the same time because you get co-emailed and all the data and people are together. And that was a safe way to do it. And that's great. It's been incredibly powerful and it was adopted very quickly because of that safe space for sharing. However, it's not publicly accessible. And if you put a candidate in and you get no match, it still sits there forever and ever and ever. So, you know, thinking about, and we're now through the Rager Consortium starting to put our gene candidates and the evidence we have into GenCC, which is a publicly accessible forum for sharing gene disease relationships, uh, including things that aren't yet published and, and which can take, as we all know, can take a year to get paper published. These can go in immediately. So another platform to think about data sharing. Now, the other thing is really making sure we're thinking globally, not just in the US. Um, if you look at uh, data submission to ClinVar, it's drastically smaller in um, in other countries compared to the US. Now, part of that is we made just a massive effort in the US to get labs to share data. It is, however, improving, and a lot more data is coming in from other countries into ClinVar, and I think that highlights there's a lot of genomic data in other countries that's being interpreted and is out there, and we have to figure out ways to interact globally. Um, I did want to just sort of mention all the systems we use to support gene and variant classification. We're actually doing, you know, overall pretty good on standards, on sharing classified genes and variants and engaging experts through ClinGen. Where we really are doing poorly is in a shared evidence base. You know, I mentioned Matchmaker Exchange. I'll talk in a minute about platforms like Anvil um, sharing through Nomad, but we still have very difficult uh, time getting access to the genotype and phenotype of most patients with rare disease. And that is, I think, where a huge effort needs to be focused is this space. We need this data to classify variants in genes. Um, and so one of the ways that we're starting to improve getting access to the actual raw gen genotypic data is through um, what we call one-sided matching. Eventually, we want to get to what we call zero-sided. You just put all the genomic data together and you can, you know, with no hypotheses, find discoveries. But we're starting in this sort of middle space to say, if you have a variant or a gene and you just want to query every genome, genome in the world, can we enable that? And so we're working through the Global Alliance um, to do that. You know, more and more data sets are putting their data out in easily accessible ways. In fact, for the All of Us data set, there's a public browser and I can, so this is a me searching a, a rare disease uh, candidate from one of our Rare Genos Project cases. I can see, it, there it is. There's one case in the All of Us genome browser with my variant. But of course, the next question is, well, do they have rare disease? Do they have my phenotype of, of our patient? And then that took, um, you know, my postdoc getting affiliation, training, clearance, and then 35 minutes to figure that out and spin up a space in the All of Us data browser or uh, workbench to try to answer that one quick question. This is not feasible for a clinical lab to, or even large research programs to one by one look at every variant in this way. Now, there are platforms, and probably Nara in her talk will talk a little bit 
about variant matcher genotype MP. These are databases allowing you to quickly, easily query their data sets. However, we, we can't have like a thousand of these that you have to go to, even if you make it easy to query. So we're all, you know, now working together through um, a, a, to build a federated approach. And um, I'm guessing Nara is going to talk about this, so I don't want to steal her thunder, um, but really trying to connect every database around the world through a common API developed through Global Alliance to allow us to quickly query and find where data is. Um, so that's great. Um, but again, you still have to have something you're querying, right? Um, some candidate. So there's a lot of stuff that we don't even know to look for, right? So how do we think about bringing the genomic data together in ways that can really be productive? And so last night I went into the Anvil platform to see what rare disease data was in there. Um, to date, I think there's basically three data sets in Anvil, the NHGRI supported cloud platform, CMG, Caesar, and Gregor. Um, although, you know, the CMG has 25,000 cases, but they're spread across 64 workspaces. It's not easy to aggregate that data. Caesar is spread across eight. Um, we've really worked to build a common data set that's joint called and harmonized through the Gregor Consortium. So all that data is only in two workspaces based on the consent levels, GRU versus HMB. So this is something I think we as a community really need to think about not just putting the data out there someplace, but how do we harmonize it, annotate it, and aggregate it in effective ways to power our discovery. Um, and there are other platforms, and you'll probably hear you know, from the, the panel, um, there's the UDM platform, the you know, um, Kids First platform, but it's really hard to share data across these platforms um, when they're on different cloud-based systems and they're not harmonized in ways. Um, through the Gregor Consortium, we've been working on a common data model to annotate both experimental data, but also annotation, oops, annotations like, is this case solved? Does it have a candidate? You know, some of the interpretive aspects of the, the data model. And I think trying to then democratize this data model so that we all start using the same ways to annotate our data will make it easier to reuse that data in useful ways. We've, we've also, through the Anvil Clinical Resource Grant, been working to bring data from clinical labs in um, into the Anvil platform when it's consented for research and actually do this on behalf of clinician researchers so that every individual clinic and clinician doesn't have to develop their own pipeline to bring data in. And instead, if they just give us a list of cases, we can work with GeneDX to build this pipeline because uh, GeneDX is the first lab we're working with and Paul can talk to that. But um, we're hoping, you know, in addition to GeneDX that every clinical lab might um, port their data into a place like Anvil. And then we're making uh, at least the Seeker platform free and accessible to those um, clinician researchers and also allowing their data to be run through an automated reinterpretation pipeline and then they get flagged if a new finding is there. So a whole point of this is to be able to really capture and reuse clinical data um, that's, uh, that's, that's generated in that environment. And then lastly, I'll mention that, you know, I mentioned earlier, it's really important that we not think just in the US, but engage um, the global rare disease community. And from our Global Alliance NIF workshop a few weeks ago, these are just some slides I stole from really innovative platforms and data sharing efforts happening across countries. So across all of England and the NHS system, across all of the labs in Australia and New Zealand, across all the labs in Canada, where they're actually harmonizing, sharing their common evidence base across all these systems. And I think we could learn something from some of the efforts happening globally and, and how to really connect data sources. Uh, with that, I just, I'll, I'll end and just say, we really need to invest in data sharing as a primary element of, of rare disease research. Classically, a lot of the consortia have research sites and data coordinating centers, but don't necessarily have groups funded specifically for the purpose of innovation and data sharing, whether it be approaches, developing incentives, building platforms and partnerships, 
to engage data sharing. And, and hopefully it's not building a brand new platform. It's, it's using the existing ones we have, but in, in useful ways. Um, and of course, most importantly, to engage all of the communities in, uh, in this data sharing, both the research, clinical apps, and patients is critical. So I think I'm gonna stop there um, and uh, turn it back over to, um, to Rob. Next slide. Great, thanks, Heidi. I always learn something new when you give a talk, so it was nice to hear you. Um, uh, Paul? Good afternoon, or good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, NHGRI and I think NARA for you for inviting me. I uh, appreciate that. Um, great to be back home. My name is Paul Krushka. I'm Chief Medical Officer at, at GeneDX and um, former alumnus of, of NHGRI. I spent a decade here. At, at NHGRI and really thankful for everything I, I've learned here and, and the contributions we were able to make when I was here. Um, so data sharing, yes, data sharing, um, we are big at, at GeneDX and myself, we are a big proponent of data sharing because it's, it's, it's the best thing for the patients. It, I think we should focus right back to the patients. We report too many VUSAs, we don't like that. We wanna give patients LPATH and PATH and we, we wanna see them um, and their diagnostic journey. So whatever it takes for data sharing, um, we are for that. Uh, um, some great things, congratulations on, on Gene Matcher, Matchmaker. Um, I've hired four genetic counselors. All they do all day is do Gene Matcher and Matchmaker. And the way I've convinced our board of directors and CEO that this is a worthwhile investment is because it turns VUSAs into LPATH. And that's good for our business because it's good for the patient. So um, that's one way of, of data sharing I, I, I put on that slide. So certainly I, I don't even think we're scratching the surface of this because I'm finding new genes in our database all the time. And I just don't have the bandwidth or time to write it up. And I'm, I'm just hoping that someone comes across it. I was preparing my, my abstract for this David Smith meeting. It's just this, this meeting I like to go to. And it, it's, it's just, I had my pick of what gene do I want to present? And I'm like, oh, if I had more time to write this up or more people. So anyways, that's one one form of, of data sharing. Um, and I, I just, I want to make the, the point that, that commercial labs, like Heidi said, I, I guess I don't even need to talk because Heidi had said all my points I wanted to make is that we just generate so much data. And um and there's a concept that I like to think about. It's not the data we have now, it's future data because we're accelerating. So the data we have now, we're gonna have triple that soon. Um, just since I've been at GeneDX, we've tripled our exome volume and tenfold our genome volume. So people are ordering more of these tests and not just geneticists or the pediatric neurologists, there's a lot of tests being ordered in it. And I see that it's accelerating. So you know, we have to think about putting um, things in place that are gonna address the future, not just what's been done in the past. Um, some of our limitations really in industry is that we don't get paid for data sharing. So, um, you know, we have to hire people like Gene Matcher team um, and we're working with Heidi on the Anvil project. And, and we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we do this? Like we're installing a bigger, I, I'm not a data, I'm a clinical geneticist, I'm a physician. So I'm just gonna talk in like terms of pipes, a bigger data pipe we're installing to send data out. And then we're working in 2025 on some cloud solutions so we can move data around better. So, you know, there, there, there are, you know, there are limits to, to, to the data we can and, and things we're addressing. But I think the future, I was talking to Tanya earlier, um, the future is really bright for, for data sharing because I, I see the technology cloud services, um, People are learning how to do, how to how to utilize these these tools. So I, I think we're going to see a lot more data sharing. I put up um, patient registries up there, and I also put up consent. So right now, in 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 the rare disease ecosystem, the patients really have a lot of control. They make their own registries. They start their own companies. They sponsor therapeutics. They raise money for therapeutics. They they form nonprofits, and Really, the, the centerpiece is the patient and the family. If they want their data shared, they consent, and we have to share it. FASTQ file, BAM file, VCF file, whatever. 
Um, and they can use that data to form registries or, or, or um, coordinate with, with, with research groups and, and academics. So that's why I, I put those two things up there. Um, I'm gonna skip ClinVar and industry because um, Heidi already went through that. I talked about data transfer um, consent. Yeah, I think I've talked about, about everything um, up there. And, and I guess the last thing is, um, I talked with Allie about this, the type of data and, and she was telling me about edge genetics or edge computing. I have to go look that up and learn about it. But you know, there, there is, we are generating a lot of data and these are big files, FASTQ files, BAM files, BCF, um, um, patient phenotypes, all, all, all these types of things. So you know, how are we dealing with all this data is, is definitely a big question for NHGRI. And it's a massive, massive amount of data. Um, so anyways, with that, I, I think I'm gonna stop. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Paul. Tanya Samicelli. Good morning. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm Tanya Simoncelli from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, uh, where's my slide? <laughs> there we go. This is kind of a busy slide. Um, but uh, when I was asked to come here and to, uh, I was specifically asked to talk a little bit about patient perspectives in this space. And that's because at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, one of our uh, major initiatives is the Rarest One Project, which I lead as part of our science and society program. Um, and that program is really premised on this idea that patients really are the center of biomedical research and our healthcare ecosystem. And so we really need to work in partnership with them and to actually really bolster their ability to um, accelerate research and um, really change our healthcare system to something that's really serving, ultimately serving them. Um, so as part of our Rares One project, um, we, are, we have built um, a network of currently about 60 rare disease organizations that we provide funding to. In addition to that, we give them um, uh, capacity building in the form of, of trainings, organizational capacity building and scientific capacity building to help um, enable them to accelerate research in their disease areas and work in partnership with researchers and clinicians. Um, so when I was asked to come here, I said, well, let's ask our community. Let's put an email out to the community, ask them about their perspectives of what's working or not working in the area of data sharing to accelerate diagnosis and um, research in their disease areas. And so this slide attempts to sort of summarize some of the key themes um, that sort of came back in response to those questions. Um, we also asked them a little bit about ways that they're, um, things that they're doing to, to help to, to work to overcome some of those um, challenges, which you can see on the right. So there were kind of five themes that emerged um, from our groups. Um, the first is around, uh, not surprisingly, technology and infrastructure challenges with data interoperability and linkage and standardization and nomenclature. Um, uh, and also um, a, a big theme, um, which Paul was just sort of getting at, is this like inability to integrate genomic data with uh, patient reported data and uh, clinical data from electronic health records. So this um, idea that, okay, we've got these large scale databases like ClinVar and these are really great, but this is just telling me if this variant is pathogenic or not, but what we really need to do to better characterize our diseases and ultimately to actually accelerate diagnosis, we need to, um, we need to be able to integrate that data with, with, with what these variants actually look like in patients um, and what the disease looks like, and we need to better characterize these diseases. And so that is the sort of the biggest pain point from their perspective is that we need to be building much more robust clinical registries and natural history studies to really move the goalpost. And that's sort of the thing that's really not happening right now. Um, on the capacity side, they talk about physicians really not having sufficient time. Like they hear this from physicians to even enter data into ClinVar, let alone um, some of the registries that they've built, like in, in some of the centers of excellence that they've stood up in some of, uh, some of these institutions. Um, lack of resources and human capital to support clinical data abstraction um, for building clinical registries. Um, and they talk a lot about the research culture. Like this is not just a technical problem, right? This is a problem where there's a lack of willingness to share sometimes that's sort of bred by this kind of publish or perish type norm in academia um, that they're, that's leading to limited incentives to collaborate and share data. And 
where exclusive access to data is viewed as a competitive advantage, especially in rare diseases and ultra rare diseases where the data are rare. <laughs> um, they, and a related issue, they, they talked a lot about um, institutional data ownership, which extends, uh, which is true in academic institutions sometimes, as well as um, commercial entities that are, that are creating data silos. Um, they mentioned the fact that commercial labs are not necessarily required to contribute to ClinVar. Some of them are doing that um, uh, voluntarily. Um, they talked about uh, how like incredibly difficult it is to um, facilitate or encourage data sharing agreements across institutions. And you know, Heidi brought up this thing at the very beginning of her talk about how rare most rare diseases are. And when your disease is that rare, you have like a couple of patients at each of these major institutions brokering an agreement across them to get limited data on a few patients. That just is crazy. So patients are, patient communities are basically saying it's much easier to leverage our right of access under HIPAA and to get paid and to build strong patient communities, identify the patients and build our own registries, which is what Paul also mentioned, and to actually um, consent to sharing that data directly. So patient directed data sharing is now seen as much more um, advantageous and easier to do, even though it's still really hard to do, <laughs> than actually taking three to five years to negotiate some kind of data sharing agreement across different academic institutions, especially when you're talking about very few patients being seen at any of those in institutions. So finally, regulatory legal compliance issues. They talked about PHI and consent requirements that are being applied very inconsistently from one institution to the next, um, and that uh, they view the data policy, um, data sharing policies as overly conservative sometimes, and that they're delaying um, the depositing of sequencing data into public databases. So those are th their perspectives, not necessarily mine, but I wanted to, sh to, to share those, um, although I do agree with many of them. Um, on the right-hand side, ways that they're overcoming um, some of these challenges themselves and sort of, I would say, kind of taking the reins um, and trying to resolve, uh, trying to solve some of these problems or address some of these bottlenecks. Um, the first one is just these groups are building patient-led collaborative research networks that are, um, first of all, they're fostering a culture of collaboration across institutions. Um, so collectively, are um, 50 rare as one network uh, patient-led organizations that were that we have funded within our network have collectively engaged more than 6,000 researchers and clinicians around the world in their networks. And that is a pretty powerful um, network and I think statement of how patient communities can really galvanize researchers to start to work together. And those have produced, you know, a couple hundred re new research projects, and some of them working on more deeply characterizing their genes or resolving variants of uncertain significance within the genes in their disease areas so that they can diagnose more patients. Um, secondly, they're enabling, as I mentioned, patient-directed sharing of data and tissues to build registries and biobanks and making those data and specimen broadly available to researchers. So they're just building independent or patient-controlled or patient-owned, quote-unquote, um, resources and assets so that they can be more freely made more, free, uh, more uh, easily accessible to researchers. They're also starting to utilize unique identifiers um, to link their data across databases and share it with researchers. Um, and they're creating partnerships with researchers and tech companies to collect and integrate patient and clinical re clinician reported data and build robust natural history studies. So for example, um, uh, I, about um, I, maybe uh, eight to 10 of our groups are now partnering with the company Citizen that is working to leverage machine learning to um, abstract um, uh, more data from medical records and ultimately with the goal of digitizing the medical record and then combining that with genomic data and building really robust um, clinical registries and natural history studies and even building natural history, natural history studies retrospectively. So rather than doing a prospective study of eight to 10 years that costs millions of dollars, they're actually collecting 10 years of data and actually um, combining that with patient reported data to actually build a natural history study in two years um, on say a hundred patients from around the world. So um, can we, you know, there, I think a lot of the groups are seeing that that is a really um, useful tool. Um, they're, importantly, they're really sharing 
like which are the registry platforms that are working best for them, which of them work best for what purposes, um, which other platforms are out there that they can use to start integrating data, um, what is working to incentivize sharing um, across uh, the research institutes. So there's a lot of sharing happening within the network about how to facilitate sharing. Um, so I would say these are great um, sort of efforts on disease by disease and within diseases and some sharing across the network and, and developing shared solutions. But these are sort of a drop in the bucket to address these really big systemic challenges. And so I guess I would say, um, you know, in conclusion, like these groups are doing, I think, heroic efforts, and really actually advancing data sharing and collaboration, despite facing significant systemic barriers and limited resources. But, and of all of the stakeholders in the ecosystem, they really have the greatest incentive to share. Um, and not only to improve diagnosis, but to make sure we don't stop at diagnosis so that the infrastructure and the resources that we're building are also important for not just diagnosing, but also learning about their disease and more deeply characterizing the disease and, and advancing um, work towards treatments and cures. So as we think about the broader infrastructure needs and the solutions over the next day or so in this meeting, um, I think it's really important that we think about um, how we can design those solutions that will help to scale some of these efforts in partnership with patient communities and ensure that they're um, relevant to their interests and needs and their efforts um, in this space. Um, and also, um, again, that the challenges in diagnosis really can't be addressed by technology alone, that patient communities are really key to building the culture that we need and also building a more equitable, ultimately a more equitable healthcare system that ensures that everybody gets access <laughs> to sequencing that they need in order to further diagnosis. Great, thanks, Tanya. And Deanna Taylor. I'm on a, is that on? Oh. Hello, okay, great. Um, I'm on a lot of projects that or that are focused on data sharing in some aspect. I'm gonna talk about kids first and then unhealthily, I don't have a slide for the other one I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> I can add one later so people can go back and check. Um, but kids first was uh, back in 2018 uh, when we were really setting up kids first to, to go. Um, it really was an open field. We were going to, the plan was to take in data from multiple different investigators on children with both birth defects uh, 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 um, either birth defects or childhood cancer and or both and get their family's genomic data, their genomic data and share it with the world. So that was, these were the uh, initial ideas that we were going to, to, to do. And we we're also gonna include genomics data from the tumors from the children with childhood cancer. And so over the years, we developed uh, several tools that allow that to happen. Um, the idea was to develop these data-driven platforms. We have a portal, Heidi actually pointed us out as, as one of the groups that are gonna share data in this larger matchmaker type of collaborative. Um, we, are, we are currently, we, we, we got around some of the uh, consent issues with some of these independent cohorts because they did come from multiple investigators. They all have different levels of consent or possibly have different levels of consent. They have different levels of phenotype data. Some of them have a lot of well annotated phenotype data. Some have very small amounts of it. How do you get around that? Um, so you could actually go to the Kids First portal now and look up a variant of interest. Um, and we also annotated it with several other tools that allow you to look at the impact of the variant, the possible impact of the variant and the frequencies and a lot of other statistics on that variant and what, and what, um, what cohort that variant was found in, but you don't really see the patient information well, you might see patient information, but you don't have the phase of that of that variant versus the rest of the genome of that patient. So that's how we kind of got around the idea of identifying uh, genotypes. Um, so, but you can still look up your variant and see if there's any kind of information there that might help with your rare, particular rare disease, um, as long as it's related to those types of diseases. But there are other types of phenotypes that aren't really necessarily just part of birth defects or maybe it's part of a larger syndrome. So there's a lot of other phenotypes in some of these children than just simply birth defects or, or childhood cancer. And the idea is we also want to allow collaborative discovery for data sharing. So allow people to bring their own data into the same environment with the Kids First data and do more analyses. So we partnered with Seven Bridges to build a platform called Cavatica. 
um, for those of you who might use Terra, it's, it's kind of the same idea. You have these spaces that could be privately shared among people. Um, there are pipelines or ability to do pipeline pipelining analyses. The cost is the Amazon AWS um, cost. It's not necessarily additional cost beyond that. Uh, it's kind of it's it's focused on childhood uh, re childhood cancer and and um, and, uh, and birth defect research, but it can be used uh, by anybody, and you can register for an account. And that hopefully allows people to actually collaborate in on uh, discovery and engage in necessary partnerships across these kinds of disease areas. We've seen people that you know know the epidemiological relationships between certain birth defects collaborate together and work in these spaces. Um, sharing data in a shared platform. And um, so we actually provide tools to share and transfer this data to analytical platforms in secure environments. And I think we also link up with Terra as well. Um, and we also want to enable rap rapid translation of personalized treatments and also accelerate discovery. So those are also part of the data sharing that we're trying to do. So Kids First is is there for people to, it, it was, it's, I think it was probably one of the first large scale projects to actively do this kind of work. And I think they kind of set the bar, which is, you know, as, as a project, it's been it's been pretty fruitful. Um, the second project I want to talk about that I did make a slide for is called the Genomic Information Commons. It's actually a pro it's it actually in process right now. It's led by Ken Mendel at Boston Children's CHOP is one of the groups that's involved with that. And um, it's also the Cincinnati Children's CHOP and Boston Children's were, were their initial leaders, but there's several other hospitals coming in now as well. And the interesting thing about this is Paul Avalak at uh, Boston um, actually built a, something called Picture, which is kind of like an intermediate API that connects a bunch of different hospitals together and data repositories together to allow you to ask a rare disease question. For example, um, I, I have this child with this genomic variant and these phenotypes. What, what, what other kids have these kinds of patterns across all these different hospitals? And it will, and it will come back and give you those answers uh, from a central API. But if you want to get that data, you have to make a request through a form that goes to that originating hospital. And then they can either release the data to you, which they, they can. Um, they can release the clinical data and the, any genomic data or biosample information data they have. Because some of these also are just biosamples but had initial genotyping. And that comes back to you. And it, it's the hospital and the group's uh, um, prerogative to share that data with you. They don't have to. Like they might say, well, I need to do it for research. I'm holding on to it. I need to work on it some more. Or they could just say, I would love to collaborate with you, which is the whole point of this project. I would love to collaborate with you. Let's bring all this data together and, and, and do research. And that's actually kind of like a safe way for people to release clinical and, and genomics and biosample data to other people in the network without actually releasing the actual data itself into the public domain. So this is kind of an intermediate step between fully public and fully private. And, and that in that space, is that's where this, this project lives. So I think that's something I wanted to make people aware of. And um, you know um, Ken Mandel at uh, at Boston Children's. If you have any information, more information you want to know that it's it's uh, Paul is probably uh, Paul Avalak and uh, Ken are probably the people to talk to. So I have other projects that I'm involved with. I do a lot of data sharing. Um, I won't go into those now, but I'll just say that it's all focused on trying to make the data as public as possible without sacrificing privacy. And the idea going back. To what Paul talked about earlier about consent is really important. Um, it would there are there are standards obviously in Europe for consent and data sharing and privacy. Um, I'm not sure if there's a better way to do it right now. But um, as children age out of you know when we had consent from their parents and they age out, we don't really have a centralized way that children can go and look up what data is stored on them in all these different hospitals and whether or not they want to consent to have it continually be used as an adult. So those are the kind of things I'd also like us to think about is like, how do we make sure that the patients are always empowered in some sort of platform somewhere that they can go look up who's got their data and whether or not they want that data to be used. So thank you. Thanks, Tina. So, um, so now we'll go move into questions. I, I, do, I do have a question to probably get us started off. And, you know, going back to Heidi's analogy of letting multiple things bloom, 
it seems like in this space, there's many of things that are blooming. Um, the question is, how do you make a bouquet <laughs> out of all these blooms of data places to deposit that data? Um, so I guess kind of a, a kind of a big picture view of how do you see effective data sharing looking in this space? I mean, one one comment I'll make is, and this is something that we focus a lot on in the Global Alliance is federated approaches. So instead of trying to build a new platform and tell everybody to put their data on it, to actually let their data sit where it is, but query it through APIs. Um, and you know that's one of the reasons we're focused on this sort of variant level matching and querying concept, because that is really amenable to the federated approach. It's a little more challenging as you want to do you know, de novo studies, aggregating data with new methods. Um, but I, but I, we're, we're all starting to even delve into that approach of, you know, how do we do broad analyses on genomic data? But I, I, I think there'll be some need to sort of spin up even temporary trusted research environments where you can bring together data sets that happened with UK Biobank and all of us in terms of some coordinate analyses is, to sort of temporarily bring it into a space, do an analysis, and then spin it back down. Um, so I, I think we are gonna have to be <laughs> innovative in thinking about ways to get access to data, even though it may not be able to leave its space or we may not want to pay for it to be in multiple places uh, given the large size of it, but that's just some thoughts. Um, I, I don't know exactly how this will all work, but we're seeing more and more um, hospital systems are linking with us through a line, a pipe API, um, and various EMR systems are developing new technologies. And I, I, I see coming soon that there is going to be a lot commercial, this is commercial industry generated data, is going to be in the EMR um, and that could be in various forms, whether that's a certain field on a report or a um, some type of um, file, like a VCF file or something like that. So um, yeah, I, I think there's more to come on that, but I, I see that's where a lot of our data is starting to move. Hmm. You know, Deanna, one of the things you comment on that really made me start thinking, I mean, does it make sense to kind of create the structure such that you could query across multiple databases to see where it's at and then permission based on the need as opposed to having some, as we said, some central database that has all the data. Um, just wondering if you would comment on that. The biggest challenge in, uh, in, in this kind of distributed model is that the data has to be available at the institution to query. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of labor that when this project at each hospital, we have we have meetings weekly or biweekly where where people are struggling through. They're either using I2B2 type of platforms or in our case, we were using Clarity, pulling from Epic Clarity dumps, which not every institution has a Clarity database, you know, dumping nightly reports out of Epic. So um, it, in a way, the distributed model works only if the institution has got the, the, the resources to make it work. And it's not very easy. So, like Paul said, if if we could get the if we could get you know people that are writing these the the EH, EH, EHRs to create a way to do this kind of data sharing, that would make it a lot more accessible. So maybe we should start contacting. I don't know if we, if we've been talking to them, but it would be great to actually do that. Um, otherwise, it, it's dead in the water. And the other thing that should be connected is you have to have. Um, connections to biobank and genomic data, which EHRs don't do a good job at mm -hmm. mostly. Most of the time when you're genomics data in EHR, it's in a PDF somewhere. Yeah. So there's really, a lot of these EHRs have to not only step up data sharing, but step up their data models. And those have to be, and once you do that, you'll get a lot more data sharing or opportunity for data sharing because everyone wants to do research, or at least a lot of places want to do research for their patients' sake, so. Yeah, I, I will mention, um, Epic is part of the Genomic Knowledge Standards Working Group in Global Alliance, and they're really trying to build that because they're bringing VCF data file formats into the EHR, but they're thankfully working with the Global Alliance to adopt the standards uh, in terms of the VERSE standard variant um, uh, representation specification and other ways, because that is going to be critical. 
I will say one of the challenges standing up this VLM network, this variant level matching is thinking about how you ready your data in a variant store to enable the APIs to access it. It's not just like, oh, just open the window and all of a sudden your data magically gets queryable. Um, and so a lot of groups, my own group included, trying to struggle with how do we create variant stores that are efficient in terms of storage, that are accessible, and thinking about that. And so we actually have a session on Sunday at the Global Alliance Connect meeting where everybody's presenting their different approaches to variant stores, you know, just how, how what's what platforms are best and what formats are best to to actually share the variant data so it's able to be queried by others. Because uh, it's not actually as as simple as it sounds. Mm -hmm. I have a question here. Let's see. I really like the model that you put forward, Deanna, in terms of thinking about how you can get different EHRs to work together. To can really because that is the biggest repository we have in terms of clinical data for individuals with rare diseases, and will be exceptionally valuable for understanding this phenotypic variability. How feasible is this in terms of thinking more broadly, like, you know, if there was to be, you know, big NIH intervention or something like that to actually make, you know, really what is, you know, sounds like a diagnosed diseases network, you know, that, you know, has this large scale phenotypic data. So I don't know if you heard of PedsNet, um, but it's, it's, it's actually a, a kind of a curated set of phenotypes, um, so kind of a learning health system across multiple systems kind of idea. But uh, they had a, a they've been around for quite a while, and part of the the this distributed network is using PedsNet data because it's they've already gone through the EHR and formed a model, and they pulled out with that model they can pull out data from the EHR at a regular or that each institution pulls out their data with this PedsNet model. So you probably are going to have to have some sort of model that everyone is sharing. It doesn't have to be the same exact model in every EHR, but there should be some sort of setup at first where these are the fields that you need for the central model. And then everyone puts in their particular variables into there and then you're done sharing. So there's a little bit of work there, but it's not a ton of work, like trying to just set up a, and then you export the data. And then PSNET actually does a, a level of curation that might be a little old fashioned, but you could, you could in theory automate a lot of this, looking for data quality or outliers in your data, flagging them, et cetera. But um, I think in order to do this, you know, from EHRs, you're probably gonna have to have a little bit of curation of some sort of central model like G, you know, GA4, GH, or some sort of model for clinical data that could then be shared across multiple institutions. Um, I don't know if we're ready yet for all the EHRs just to dump all their data in. I mean, you could use fire models to transmit data back and forth, but do you, I mean, it would probably have to be something you structured, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there's always going to be work for so so in terms of like effort that we put into things, we can even start off simply with supporting things like GA4, GH or other other types of organizations or, or groups are putting together groups that can set up these standards and then set up pilots across multiple institutions. I mean, that that isn't a huge spend, right? It's just people labor at that point. But um, I don't know. That's that's where I would go with it. Look at PSNET, for example, as a model and others. Oh, we have a question in the back. So in the yeah, in the last session, there was a bit of discussion about the need to know the haplotype frequencies in the population. And and here we're, we're mostly talking about variants. How do you how do you all see moving past variants to actual haplotype um, data data releases and sharing? Uh, first, sharing it um, not publicly, but uh, maybe internally between different trusted research groups and maybe trusted en enclaves. But but additionally, I'm interested if you've thought about differential privacy as a mechanism to, to enable public data sharing out of what are typically private data sets without releasing def uh, identifiable information. Sorry, can you explain the differential? Uh... So uh, differential privacy is a, um, it is a uh, set of approaches that allow you to calibrate the amount of, of private information that's released um, when you when you put certain data into the public domain, and in effect, they have you can have a parameter that says how far your data set can move in a high dimensional space when you add or subtract an individual. And if that if that distance is very very small, then your differential privacy privacy mechanism 
is preserving a lot of privacy and preventing release of information about individuals. But you'll typically be capturing group characteristics. Like you'll be able to say things like, what is the frequency of a variant? Um, maybe w without without risk of actually releasing information about individuals, which is is not really something that's happening right now with like with these releases of variant frequency lists. Like I think those actually are not differentially private. And just a matter of time until someone kind of hacks them to show that they're they're releasing this. But I'm I'm just curious about like these two directions in effect. Like how do we get bigger chunks of genetic information into the public space for 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 un, unrestricted sharing? And also what what are the mechanisms that are being discussed and, and considered about how to do that? It's a great question. You know, in in Nomad, we have released a variant co-occurrence tool. Um, so that you can use, so, so that we can release a likelihood that two variants co-occur to a public interface, even though we can't release individual level data specifically. And so it's it's at least a tool to kind of get at some of those things where we can put, you know, just on the public nomad site, you can put two variants in and ask uh, what's the likelihood they're in cis or trans, right? Things like that. But I think ultimately, to really do this at scale, we we will need the ability to actually analyze primary data in a lot of cases if you're really interested in haplotypes and understanding their contribution. But I think you know trying to decide where to invest your energy and getting access to primary data, you want to at least query first and say, do, do any of my variants or interesting things exist in this data set so that I should then invest the energy to get access to that data, which usually requires a lot more paperwork. <laughs> so I think this is probably a state that will sit in where, where we, we allow limited insight into some of this data through different kinds of queries, but then spin up these trusted research environments where we actually can use individual level data and really have the full haplotypes to do that, if that makes sense. So it's just a kind of follow up. Like, are there, do you see that there are hard lines that kind of say, like, we will never be able to release haplotype data of any type, you know, even if it's under some mathematical guarantees or like, like, are there existing features of the, the data resources that would prevent that in the future? And is that what did, if there are, would it suggest the need to change regulation and, and, and habit to make it possible to release them in, in an era when we're going to have complete genomes as a standard, a standard entity? Yeah, I mean, I think there's different levels of, of release, like the consent that's been negotiated for pan genome genomes, where we're really saying you're going to put this genome out in a public environment, the entirety of it. That's a pretty li massive lift in the consent process for those individuals. On the other hand, for our rare genomes project, we deeply consent these individuals and we're able to take those entire genomic data sets. And like for the KG project, we shared you know, 30 or 60, I forget, genomes with a whole bunch of groups all around the world that were testing out, you know, their genomic analysis platforms. And those data were able to be downloaded, shared, and used in those environments, despite the fact that that was entirely full genomic data, right? So I do think it's incumbent upon us to push the limits as far as we can in terms of how widely d data can be shared. But we also have to remember, you know, that we can't guarantee the privacy of that data and and be respectful of the people who shared that data and their wishes. That said, in the rare disease space, most families actually want their data shared more broadly than we all do. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to grant their wishes and share that data as broadly as we can. We had a question back with our Wasaba, and then we have one up here, and then Carolyn, I'll get to you next. My question was, you know, uh, can we sort of democratize the data sharing platform rather than having data in silo? You know, can we make patient the owner, owner of the data? Is that something completely crazy to think about, you know, or is that is that possible? Yeah, so I think I, I'll take a stab at that one. So I think one of the points I'm making is that actually we're seeing more and more patient directed data sharing. I, I don't, I put the word ownership in quotes on my slide because I don't really like that that phrase because no one really owns data. Um, patients, it's really about who's controlling the data and who's controlling access and who's making decisions. And I think patient communities more and more, are, it's not that they would be happy if their data were sitting in academic institutions if it were being shared <laughs> the way that they want it to be shared. 
and it's not, and it's exceedingly frustrating if you have a rare disease. Um, and, you know, to Heidi, Heidi just made the point, I think that most, I think studies have shown over and over again that patients with rare diseases really want their data shared. And so we should be listening to what they want and listening to sort of, and making sure that the policies actually that we have in place really reflect um, their interests and needs. And um, maybe that means there's, we don't have a one size fits all in terms of, of privacy requirements and standards and, and how consent should look. So, um, so to your point, I think we're seeing more and more examples where, where patients are really directing their data to be shared and actually insisting on it and requesting it and leveraging their right of access under HIPAA, giving third parties the right to request their data and assemble it into an independent database. And there are some really, really, really successful examples of this. So um, one of our grantees, it's, it's not part of our network, it's just a, a separate grant that we gave is to the Rare Cancer Research Foundation. And they have a, a, a something called pattern.org where they, they actually started out taking on the, I think one of the hardest things that you can think about in data share and in, in sharing of specimens, which is they, they are enabling patients with rare cancers to direct their live tissues, to actually go to their surgeons before their biopsies and request that they actually cut off a piece of their tissue and send it um, to pattern um, to build, to be able to create cell lines from these rare cancers. And if you think about this logistically, this is actually incredibly hard to do. And they have to date sourced over the last few years, they've sourced tissues from over a hundred different medical institutions. And they are now working with all the major cancer centers, actually sourcing tissues to MD Anderson and other cancer centers. And they've generated something like 70 new cell lines in totally novel cancers, um, totally novel cancer lines. Um, Incredible, all and all, of course, being deposited so that they're open. This has actually started out as a as a collaboration with the Broad Institute, but they've now gone on from there because they're also consenting the patients at the time that they collect their tissues to share their medical records. And now Pattern is working and saying, you know what, we need a centralized bank of. Uh, it's great that we're sourcing the tissues to the institutions that can build the cell lines, but let's also create a centralized bank of tissues along with medical records, because we we're doing it anyway. And so they're gonna do paraffin embedded tissues along with um, medical records all in the same time. And if you think about this, they are partnering with something like 200 rare cancer organizations that are their partners and helping to get the word out to the patients. And it's, it's just incredibly successful what they've been able to do. And the cancer institutions like MD Anderson are telling them you're doing something we tried for years and we were unsuccessful at doing. And it's, and it's because these patient communities have the motivation and they're interested in exactly what you're saying, which is democratizing access um, and making sure that their tissues and samples are, and, and data are widely accessible for research. And I, I actually got my personal genome done by Dante Labs when they had their special that they have once in a while. I, I'm not a stockholder, Dante Labs. But uh, they, they, they actually give a data sharing option. I forget the website. I'll have, to, I'll have to get back to anyone who's interested. But there's a patient-focused website where you can share your data and share it to distribute to other people. I don't know if anyone's run into this website, but... I, I don't remember the name of it right now, I'm sorry, but um, th there are tools out there now being built that where patients can share the data and make it open for other people to just come in and use, so. Okay, I have multiple questions now and I don't know which one to ask. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the my old question. So Deanne, when you were talking about the genomic uh, information commons, yeah. What basically what you described sounded to me like almost my understanding of matchmaker exchange. So so we have now like multiple federated platforms for sharing data. How do we federate the federated platforms <laughs> so that so that we're centralizing things as much? Like what are sort of the barriers that have sort of created these multiple federated platforms and what do we need to do to kind of bring everything together in one ring to rule them all, right? Well, it's not just for diseases, uh, for the GIC, it's really for any, any, any disease. It could be, you know, you want children who had diabetes with mothers under the age of 40, 
who themselves also maybe had childhood cancer. So you can actually, all the clinical data, I'm not saying Matchmaker can't do that, but I'm saying that this that's where GIC was going. It's like you, you might want to put larger population of kids, like 50 to 100 kids or more. Um, it's not just for the very rare cases. So it would be where, you know, a researcher is interested in a large project. It could be a smaller project as well. You may have only a couple of kids with this rare disease, but you have the full, you have this very large clinical data repository that they can pull from. So that was the original intent. And I think it goes through NCATS. Um, so CTSA kind of kind of uh, project. So that's where they, they came from. But I do think this is the model of these federated networks of federated data in the sense that, for instance, the Sharian Australian system, they build a centralized platform that connects all of the different clinical labs in Australia. We can build an API to Sharian as a central system that's already pulling in the data from all those other systems. Same with the Canadian all for one sort of premise there that they are on a common platform, but then we could build an API just to the, the, the single point. So I, I think the API based approach allows you to link it to any point in the system that is either a hub of of data sets where somebody's helping all those groups manage their data sharing. And same with Seeker, like at, at the Broad, we have you know hundreds of collaborators. We're essentially managing the sharing of their data for them through our Seeker platform. Right, okay, but so I've learned so much about federated data sharing over the last five years. Uh, it was a complete mystery to me. But one of the things that I have found really striking is even within the context of Matchmaker Exchange and the different sites that participate in that, getting all of them to share data in the same way to really enable even the full amount of data sharing across the member platforms in one federated data system is not simple. And so I can imagine that that compounds now when you're trying to bring in the Australian one and the Canadian one and, and all of these other ones. So how do you get everybody sort of in agreement on how we're going to share data, what we're going to share so that it all works together in a more seamless way. When we first built the Matchmaker Exchange, we agreed on a very small and limited set of required fields, gene name, phenotype, uh, the, the, the accession number, you know, there's just a very small number and everybody had to agree to that. And we set the standard for each of those fields has to be HGNC nomenclature for the gene symbol. You know, the phenotype was either an OMIM disease or HPO, you know, and so on. And then from there, we allowed other fields as optional fields. Um, but we at least standardized those optional fields so that if you were going to use them, they adhere to certain formats. So I, I think, and you know, some of the other APIs, the Beacon version two API um, now has a lot more fields. So we're starting to think about queries that are, do you have any predicted loss of function variant in this gene in your case? Because honestly, most of us, when we match in gene matcher um, or matchmaker exchange, it's not matching on the variant. It's the gene match with distinct variants and almost no one has the variant. So you, when you query these genomes hoping to build evidence, you have to say, well, does anyone have a, a variant in this you know, region of the protein or that's of this type or whatever if you're gonna find those matches? So I, there's a long-winded way of saying we can, you know, it's critical that we be flexible so that everybody doesn't have to adopt the same database but we can define a set of fields and the structure of the data in those fields so that where we're aggregating and requiring that, they're actually in the same format. So we- um, we, we, we have some questions. Nara, do you wanna- did you well, Yeah. Uh, so but why I was going to ask the panel to talk about the, and I know that Heidi and I have been talking about it, the limitations and the difficulties of the of sharing phenotype data. So how, how are we dealing with it as we are working on mat variant matching uh, and talking about sharing phenotype to actually inform the matching better on that one variant? How can we do that? What are, what are different platforms, Cavarica, GeneDx, variant matching level, or the patient groups, how are they dealing with sharing the phenotype data? And I'll just make one comment, and everybody knows how in favor I am from of data sharing. 
But when we say like the patients all want to share the data, all want to share the data, and most of them do want, but we have to remember that there are some small populations out there that are still very careful and worried about data sharing. And when they ask us, what can we guarantee that's not going to happen to that data if they share the data? We don't really know what we can guarantee that's not going to happen. So there was a very good discussion about that in the ACMG last year. I just just bringing that up to us to think of it also, as we say, like they all want to share. They, they most of all want to share, and we want them to share. But there are these other, there's a small group of patients that are still careful and with some reason. Actually, I want to point to Paul to answer a question. You, you, I think, are the largest user of Gene Matcher and probably the whole Matchmaker Exchange at GeneDx. But to Nara's point, what what do you feel comfortable putting into gene matcher in terms of phenotype and how do you see the resources required to get some degree of consent on a rec form and you know how do you think about the the phenotype the data sharing and the resources involved in a massive volume of samples yeah this is a I, I think this is a moving target so maybe start with clinvar we don't put phenotypes in we could um but we we don't know um I, I think it has to be better to find what can we put in there. And then, it, you know, another thing with ClinVar, at least, we actually have a lot of variants that are pathogenic or likely pathogenic. And we have multiple different patients with the exact same variant. So there, that, that's one thing we, we've, we've thought a lot about with ClinVar. So gene matcher, um, I'm going to have to think through this for a second because I, I don't do the actual gene matching myself. Um, we so people put into gene matcher or matchmaker a variant, and then there's a connection. Hey, I guess it's through uh, email. Do you have what phenotype? I would have to ask our GCs how we do that. I know what we do is we connect the the ordering providers is the way we do it. So then, you know, um, you know, um, and at Boston Children's. And Bob at Medical University of South Carolina, you guys talk type of thing. Yeah, I, I so, think that's how we do it. But I, I would have to get back to you because I don't do the actual matching. It's a good question. No, I think I think because gene matcher is basically a gene database. Um, there is no phenotype that goes immediately. So what happened is from my experience when we match with GeneDx is there is a mail that's a, a, that we exchange, and once the counselor in GeneDx got the, the authorization basically from the physician that submitted that case, then they will tell us about the phenotype. So they do go through a, a process of talking to the physicians who submitted that case to GeneDx and ask them if it's okay to share. But my point is like, what are you thinking about the policies behind sharing phenotype? Like maybe, the clean is a better, because you have thought more about it, a better example of like, what were the limitations of putting phenotype in clean or is it like policy? Is it just hands that you don't have enough to do it because it's a lot of data? So, and that that's my question. I think clean is a better example for that question. Paul. Yeah, I, um, all, all of the above. Um, the, we, it's manual. People are putting in phenotypes. We don't know how much of a phenotype to put in. There have been um, investigators out there that have proposed projects where they consent the people in their um, in their cohort, their institution. I'm consenting you, and they've asked us, um, "Can we put phenotypes in a clinvar? We've consented these people. We, we want to put phenotypes in." There's a few proposals out there, pilot projects, but we, we haven't been able to make it work. Carolyn, we. I'll pick your microphone. Okay, so I think my question ties a little bit to Eric's comment and then one of the examples Tanya gave. Mm -hmm. We've been talking a lot about the variant matching paradigm and I understand the driving of that, but are, is the type of data, you know, when you find these case, these situations, does, you know, to your point, 
it's not scaling, right? You were saying, um, Heidi, you know, your your person had to go and look into the database and go there. Like, is the data, is the backup data that you're wanting accessible? Is the information when you find a match that's there from different technologies or phenotypic data or what is it easily available? And does that need, is, how is that going to scale? Or do you think that's not actually a major issue of what's needed in the data sharing space? I mean, I think um, I think the data is there, but you have to have access to the data. And so the question is, um, what do we allow to go beyond? So clearly, there's data on the public browser for all of us, um, and you can. And in fact, for the UK Biobank, Conrad, who's in the back, helped build the GeneBast.org, where both phenotypes and variants are present. Now they're they're you know, ICD-9 code level phenotypes, right? But I think to Nara's point earlier, like thinking about what can we put out there publicly? What could we put out through an easy query versus what do you have to get permission and training and, you know, access to log in and, and use on a secure platform? And we wrote a paper for ClinVar now 10 years ago to say, you can, without any patient consent as a clinical lab or clinical research group, put both the variant and phenotype in structured form, like HPO terms, things like that, without consent. And we basically argued, you know, with some exception of whether you consider that phenotype sensitive data, which is almost none of it. But, but like, I think it's those points of guidance, like Paul said, we need guidance as to what we're allowed to do. And so I think you know, clearly we might need a refresh of that paper. People aren't aware of it and, you know, it'd be more specific, but it is tricky because it's like, well, just a few HPO terms is fine, but what if I have 35 HPO terms? Like, you know, like how many is too many? And, you know, for some patients, like put them all, put 60 of them. I don't care. Just solve my disease. And the next person you're like, Ooh, you know, that's probably the only person in the world with those five, you know, so, so it is a little tricky, you know, and we, Nara and, I, and Ada and I were spent, you know, half an hour trying to decide, should we just decide how common these are and what combinations and, you know, all sorts of things. And finally we're like, no, we're just going to say they're structured data, you know, put it out there. If you think it could be sensitive, that's one thing. But if you're not dealing with sensitive phenotypes like abortion status or something, which is not really one here, um, then then put it out there as structured form, right? Yeah. And then, because if you start thinking about some of the other omics as well, like, is that available? Is that even there for that particular participant? Is that something you think that you need? I, I mean, I think it's that question about even if you don't get into the specifics specifics of it, what type of additional data is available, I think isn't always clear. So uh, sure. just to let people know we are at time, we are at time. Um, and this has been a great discussion. The great news is I get to tell you you have lunch. There should be box lunches showing up somewhere. Hopefully out there. Hopefully out there and we can continue these conversations. I know I didn't get to all the questions. Uh, it's a great topic, um, and we want to thank our panelists for doing great presentations and engaging in the questions. So 